Good morning. How are we this morning? Did you did you hear the thunder this morning? <laughs> well, we had a great time last week in Columbus, and uh, we were worshiping with the uh, Vineyard Church, one of the Vineyard churches. They have. I think five or five or six locations around Columbus, and there was just one that was within ten minutes of where our hotel was, and we went there. And what they do is they broadcast live from one location, and they the feed goes to all six of these. But they have their own worship, and then they have their own ministry afterward. And, it was really good. It was, uh, there was a very good spirit there. And I heard there was a very good spirit here too. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited about that. Sam, could you uh, stand and just lead us in prayer, asking the, asking the Lord just to guide our time together. And we would not just have a good time, but a, a great time in Him. you have made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank, Thank you, Lord, for the breath you give us. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the thoughts that you put in our mind that draw us to you. Lord, capture our hearts in their entirety. Let there not be anything within us, Lord, that remains of filthiness, boastfulness, arrogance, indifference, intolerance, injustice. Remove from us, Lord, the things that hold us back, that keep us from pressing into You and being an effective witness in this world and an effective minister for Your kingdom. Have Your will and Your way in our lives. And Lord, I pray that none of us would hold back from You anything that You would put Your finger upon to change. Lord, we celebrate today gathering in our new building. And I think most of us are here today, if not all of us. So Lord, thank You for this opportunity that You've given us here. Help us to rise up, Lord, and to be the church. Not just in this building, Lord, but in the community. That wherever we go, Lord, we bring the kingdom with us. Your love, your power, your effectiveness. So, Lord, we celebrate you today. Thank you for this day. We rejoice in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> As it seems fit, you can you can uh, sit or stand or however it seems good for you to worship. Just just be yourself. I was sinking in my sin. I was buried in my shame. Through the darkness, you reached out.
up. You took God's hand this week and then looked for someone else who needed a helping hand. His power is endless. He lives within us. We know the greatness of our God. Along the same line, Bill Johnson says that kingdom living and power are the normal Christian life. Who needs a new normal? Scrap that. We just need to claim his resurrection power as our normal so that we can step out and be the presence of Jesus Amen. to the people Amen. we need. Right. <laughs> been and where I'm going even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it 
That's right. There was Jesus. Getting through. 
life, even when you can't see, that we know He's a good God. If it would not be for the Lord's great love, we would be consumed. Therefore, we have hope. So I will trust. Oh, I will trust you. Morning by morning.
with cords of kindness and bands of love. Tenderize our hearts and escort us into the chambers of your heart that we would position our hearts to live by desire for you. That deep would call to deep and we would be lost in the wonder of you. That we would rearrange our lives, our time, our money, our comforts to worship you. That with undistracted devotion, we would rise up with the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah, scattering your enemies. That you would train our hands for battle and our fingers for war. That you would come in your glory and that Christ in us, the hope of glory, would draw others to you. That you would light in each of us a fire, that we would walk in the mandates of our calling, laborers sent into the harvest fields. Open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, and pour out your presence, your sevenfold spirit upon us, that we would spread everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of God. Amen. I'm starting a new series this Sunday called Winsome. It's about being winsome that we might win some. It's about being God aware and self aware and other aware. So, Lord, make us winsome. Ron? I just yeah, just put just put me on it. There we are. I'm working on it. There we are. Glad you're here this morning. And those of you online too. It was a couple weeks ago. We were in our garage, and I asked if anybody wanted to contribute. Because it to, to go online, it does cost money and different things like that. And there were people, there was at least one person that gave, and gave to me personally, I want to say thank you. And, um, you know, we live in a different age, don't we? Mm -hmm. Very much. And um, God wants to reach people right here in the now. And sometimes it's, it's people that are just at home and they're sick or they don't know where to go and they... They turn on something, and God's there, and God meets them. Anyway, Benita and I were in Columbus last week, and it was gorgeous weather, actually. Very gorgeous weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we biked 25 miles on uh, Friday, and uh, this was, it was the Olin Tangy Trail. That's, that's a little picture of that. Now, Google said Olin Tangy Trail. <laughs> so when I was looking for it, you know, you press it in Google Maps, and you know, it says that you turn, oh, this is the only the Olin Tangy River. <laughs> it, 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 it does look like Tangy. I said, I, I said to Benita, I said, I think if you probably dipped a cup in there and drank it, it'd probably be a little tangy. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a gorgeous day. And that, that was, uh, we, we went 25 miles on that one. And then the next one, we went on 40 miles, which I, I think this is a, the Alum Creek Trail. That's a beautiful trail. And uh, that's, a, I think it's just 26 miles one way. If you want to go one way and back, then it's 52 miles. Well, I haven't biked a lot this year yet, so I, I said, let's just go the 40, and then we come back. And then everything was fine, you know. It, it, but anyway, it was gorgeous. 
And uh, here is a shot of the, uh, the next one there, the sawmill vineyard in Columbus. We were there, and they have these windows in the back. And there, there was a good spirit there, and uh, we really enjoyed that. So we're starting a brand new series. Normally, starting on a brand new series is, is probably more difficult once you're in it. You know, it's, it's probably about like, uh, I don't know why I want to say this, it's, it's about like plane riding. The crash has happened on the takeoff and on the landing. I'm trying to take off right now. <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to crash this morning, but you have to give extra attention uh, how to get into things and then... You know, and that's, that's the way it normally is in a speech, how you open it and how you close. Once you're in it, it's not as, it's not as critical. You know, you're, you're kind of in the flow, but it's the, it's the takeoff. So we're going to take off here. And I, I, I yeah, let's that's, that's, that's go to this. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Ha, ha, yeah, take my, take my picture out of there. We're ruining this. <laughs> now, when I, I th when you think of winsome, what do you think of? Young, lift, uh, alive. It's not a word I've ever heard. Pleasantly, full of energy. Pleasantly attractive. Is that what the world would call Christians? Winsome. We're going to kind of get into that. But when I saw that picture, I tell you, isn't that, isn't she inviting? She's light. She's got energy. And um, she has joy. And that is in the, that is what winsome means. And here, we'll get into the, we'll get into the word. Let's, the origin of winsome is the old English winsome, which means joy. joy. And some means some, so it means joysome. And here are some of the words that describe that as you, you get into the, the dictionary. Appealing, captivating, delightful, engaging, alluring, attractive, charismatic, desirable, inviting, enthralling, and, and you know, so on and so forth. These great words, winsome. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, which we're going to really look into next week. But he says, I have become all things to all people in order that I may win some. And now it's not this win some. In order that I might save some. There was something about Jesus that was this. He attracted people. People wanted to be near him. Especially those that didn't think like him. How many of us love to hang around people that don't think like us at all? <laughs> this is what Jesus did. It, it was the people that were nearer somewhat how they thought about him that clashed with him it seemed. Which is very interesting. Because I don't think Jesus had a religious bone in his body, but he was spiritual. This is what we're, we're going to get in. This is, this is kind of the series what we're going to get into. Lord, I just pray that you would help us, help me, help me deliver it well, and help us hear you. Amen? So what do non-Christians really think about Christians? What do people that don't know Jesus think about people that they say are Christian? This is Jen's favorite part. We're going to get in a little group and we're going to talk about this. Welcome back. Welcome back, Jen. So, so we're going to get into, just get in, you know, just talk with your neighbors. I'm going to go scoot over to David over there. He seems a little bit on the outside. So I'm going to talk with him and I are going to have a chat. We're going we're gonna to get into it. So just talk among yourselves. What do non-Christians really think about Christians? What have you heard or what do you... Uh...
you know, maybe you don't know Jesus here today, and you're saying, man, they're talking about me. That's okay. <laughs> it's all right, you know. It's, you know, I, it, yeah. we'll have fun. So what do you what did you come up with? Anybody come up with some? Hey Ron, Mike. Oh Mike, Mike. Yeah. Anybody if you anybody come up? Well, so what? People that don't associate with Jesus really think about Christians. What did you? Uh, what did you? What did you come up with? How did you guys share? Just, just speak it out. It's fine. Well, one of the thoughts I had before I knew the Lord was that Christians thought they were better than everybody else. Okay. There, there's this pride and looking down, and holier than thou kind of thank you. I, I preached a message one time. It was called Camel Nosed. Because a camel's nose sticks up in the air slightly. <laughs> And it was called it was called camel nosed, and it's all about pride and holier than thou, looking down at everybody. <laughs> we used to have that. I used to be a pastor at this one church, and there were we were down in the valley, down in the little valley, and there was a church that was up on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, him and I were talking. He says, "I always look down on you guys." <laughs> And I said, I know, I hate that. <laughs> Did you tell him you always look up? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> but we, do, we had a good relationship. He was a good guy. He was a good guy. I really liked him. 
There was uh, anyone okay? You know, holier now. Uh, what? Up? The first thing that somebody may notice about a Christian is not their love, but maybe their judgmental spirit. Judgmental that was a very spirit. Spirit. Right on that. Very similar to what you said. Critical yeah, the, uh, critical, not criticizing. Their not their love. Correct, correcting, trying to correct people no. or things or whatever. Mm -hmm. A little bit out of line. Or, Well, it's not looking too good for the Christians right now. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Well, I can't speak for other Christians, but I can speak for myself. And I think there are some days where I go out there and I give off the fragrance and aroma of Christ, and some people think, man, this guy's a prophet. And there's other days where I go out there and I give off anything but the aroma of Christ. And if they know I'm a Christian... What a jerk. I hope I never see this guy again. Now, those times aren't very often anymore, but they're still there. Occasionally. Well, I, I think you're right. I think the world gets a mixed bag. Yeah. It's all over the place because you know, when you come to Christian, when you come to know Jesus, you, I mean, you, can't, you don't change instantly. And we're still changing to the day that we leave this earth. But there needs to be a humility about where we are and a reality of, of sharing about, you know, I don't necessarily have it together. That's why I do know. That's why I have hooked myself up to Jesus. I need help, Lord. And, you know, other people can help us out that don't even know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Glenn and I were, were driving home one day this week and, and uh, went by this one corner and there were people out there and they had their signs up, you know. I said, well, this is gonna, probably Black Lives Matter or something like that. And I got up there and said, <laughs> one guy had three signs. I said, God hates what is it? Workers, of Workers of iniquity. And we discussed it for five minutes after that. I, said, I, was, I felt embarrassed because they were saying, God hates these people. That was what I read on the sign. And they, they probably have a, have a heart to do some things, but they're doing it in a way that is looking down or whatever. I said, God hates the sin. He doesn't hate the sinner. He loves everybody. And I was just thinking, I told her, I said, I wonder what that guy was like when he, how he felt when he was a, quote, you know, well, person of iniquity. Because where were, well, I grew up in the church. Well, you go back then, it's just like, that's something that just, that preaches a lot more of the critical side than the, than the loving side. And I just, it, it, it really bothered me. We, I, we were just discussing back, I was trying not to judge him, but it was just like, they're, yeah, yeah, it's it just did not side? come across well at all. That's uh, that right. That's difficult. Now there was a study done by Tom Rainer, Tom R A I N E R Rainer. He is the founder of the Billy Graham School of Evangelism, and they and they asked thousands of persons that didn't know Jesus this very question. How do you view people that know Jesus? What do non-Christians think about Christians? And this is what they say. Christians are against more things than they are for. Just what you were saying. We're against this. We're against iniquity. We're against... And this was the caption underneath. They kind of just put it together, the kinds of things that people said. It just seems to me Christians are mad at the world and mad at each other. They are so negative, they seem unhappy. I have no desire to be like them and stay upset all the time. That's one view. That is, they were, there were seven views. I'm going to talk about four of them. But the seven views 
but the four what, that I'm talking about, this is one of the primary ways that people that don't know Jesus look at Christians. What do you think about this? No, let's go back. Let's go back. They're mad at the world and mad at each other. I think, and I'm going to, I have a slide on this, but it's clear. We know that if we're going to talk with people that don't know Jesus, if you are a believer in Jesus, that you're going to run into differences of opinions. I think we all understand that. We have to learn how to know how to navigate in a Christian way, conversations. But not only out there, we need to know how to navigate Christian conversations within the body of Christ. I have been a pastor for 40 years. My, I came to know Jesus when I was 16. Every church I've been in, including the one that I was in my youth, Every church that I've been in, there have been fights and splits. And what happens when there are fights and splits? What happens? There is, when there is fighting within the church and splitting within the church, there is absolutely no ministry that goes outside. Who wants to bring anybody into that? Nobody. People get upset. Even people that were a part of the congregation fall away. There is nothing that is good that comes out of that. This is one of the big things that we're going to talk about today is how we talk with one another. How we talk with people that don't think like us. How we talk with people that don't think like us within the four walls. That is huge. How and you know where it starts? It starts right in our families. How do we talk with our spouses and our children and our relatives and our friends? Yes, sir. Isn't that it? Because mm -hmm. yep. uh, we can't be a chameleon. All of a sudden, we're like this here and like this here. Eventually, the real you is going to come out. Why am I talking about this? Because I believe this is a huge deal. Huge. It's, isn't it huge? Yes, huge? And some of us have an argumentative spirit. Huge. <clears throat> and that has got to go. Yes, sir. Well, you know, how do you make it go? Well, I'll probably, I'll probably tap you on the shoulder if I see it. I mean, the only way I can deal with things is when I see it. I've had so many people come up to me as a pastor. Pastor, so-and-so is doing this. Which, what am I supposed to say? I'm going to go there and straighten them out? I'm going to say, so what did you do about it? You know, either if we let that go on, we're just as guilty as anybody else. Right? And when I say let it go on, we need to pull someone off to the side and say, and say you know, you, there is a problem. And people have blind spots. Well, I don't have a problem. And they'll argue with you and quarrel with you and get mad at you right there. <laughs> it's just like self-revelation. But this is a huge deal. Negativeness, unhappiness. Lots of Christians look like they've been baptized in prune juice. <laughs> that, 
That's not winsome. We need to have joy. There's joy in the house. This is the house. This is where God wants joy. This is where God lives. Amen? This is the house. <laughs> okay, what, what was the next thing? I don't see much difference in the way Christians live compared to others. This is another big thing that people of faith see about and they view Christians. They say, I really can't tell what a Christian believes because he doesn't see much different than other people I know. So why be a Christian, right? They really don't act any different. Or they justify their weird behaviors by some, by, how many have ever had people use scripture in a negative way to justify what they think and to put you down? <laughs> that is not what scripture's for. That's not what God is asking script. That, that's not what it's for. But this is a huge deal. Barna had a study many years ago that talked about this very thing. Christians gamble just as much as the normal population. Christians have just as many divorces as the normal population. And it goes on and on and on and on. Christians have drinking problems just as much as the normal population. Sexual issues just as much as the normal population. It was, it was a startling discovery. Because he took all these thousands upon thousands of interviews and compiled it. At Barna Research Group. Look up the Barna Research Group. This is what they do. They have many studies. Next. I would like to develop a friendship with a Christian. Now, look, this is one of the top answers. Did you know that people who don't know Jesus say, I want to develop a friendship with a Christian? That means there's open doors. You know what the proverb says? You know how you, you, know how you can make friends? This is what it says in the King James. Be friendly. There's a thought. <laughs> I always liked that little verse. It, was, it said the King James. That's how it says. Those who are, you know, if you want to make friends, be friendly. That's, that's, and this is what they say. I'm really interested in what they believe and how they carry out their beliefs. Now, if you're more connected to the previous screen, that what you believe doesn't really change your behaviors, it may not be good for you to have a great friendship with them. Right? Yes. But they're interested in what you believe and how they carry out, how you carry out your beliefs. I wish I could find a Christian who would be willing to spend some time with me. Wow, what do you think about that? Spend time with. Do we get, do we try to spend time with people that, that would be a reach to spend time with other people. But that's where real relationship and life gets passed is when we spend time with. The New Testament calls it our oikos, our, the household that we, we have influence in. Yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, I pick up a lot of college students that are from other countries. And I remember there have been others besides this gal that I've done this <coughs> with. She was a Japanese uh, young lady. And uh, so it was a 45-minute ride, and I asked her, you know, we talked about a few things, warmed up, and then I asked her a Christian question. She said she had no familiarity, familiarity with the Bible. So for the next 40 minutes, I went from Genesis to Revelation with stops in between to ask if this was okay, you know, what do you think? And she says, I want to hear more. 
So, you know, it was one of those, Lord, give me the words to speak as I was sharing, got to the airport, asked her the salvation question. She wasn't ready, but man, did we sow a lot of seeds. Well, that's awesome. There's an openness there. A hunger. As a, uh, as a Lyft driver, you've got a captive audience. I mean, it's wonderful. But that's, that's some of the beauty uh, of your job is just that you have no idea who's going to be coming into your atmosphere. Yes, sir. And that's the beautiful, they're coming into your atmosphere. You don't have to go into yes, theirs. The fragrance and aroma. <laughs> and, and, you know, the biggest atmosphere that we carry is this atmosphere right here. Isn't that right? Yes. Sir. If you don't like the atmosphere, carry your atmosphere in. <laughs> okay, a, th uh, a fourth thing. Some Christians try to act like they have no problems. This is what people that say uh, that don't know Jesus talk about Christians. And this is one person who says, Harriet works in my department. She's one of those Christians who seems to have a mask on. Well, obviously, we're not talking about COVID masks. Mm -hmm. I would respect her more if she didn't put on such an act. I know better. They're wanting someone real. They're wanting real people. You don't have to have it all together. I'm scared when someone looks like they have it all together. Aren't you? I'm going to say, well, you know, just, just get real with this thing. So, I, I think I have a question here. Oh, that was another, excuse me. Another, I, I wish a Christian church would take me, I wish a Christian would take me to his or her church. People want Christians to invite them to their church. Isn't that interesting? And this is what one person says, I really would like to visit a church, but I'm not particularly com comfortable going by myself, which is weird, is that I am 32 years old and I've never had a Christian invite me to church in my entire life. Oh my word. Wow. What do you think about that? You know, there, I mean, it was, it was some years ago in Orville, we went around and we took interviews. Half the people in Orville don't go to church, period. It's more than half in all Wayne County. And there are people that have fallen between the cracks. Christians are in the minority. This is not a Christian nation. It's not. I agree. Yeah, it's, it, we have something to offer that is so life changing. <coughs> and if you know this, I would imagine it should beam off of you. That's what we want to be is winsome. Okay, next. So what would make Christ followers more appealing and attractive? Let's get in our little groups again. What would make Christ followers more appealing and attractive? Winsome, like El.
Okay, so what would make Christ followers more appealing? There's all sorts of great answers to this. Yes. What would make Christ followers more appealing? And if we really want to get, if we really want to get fine-tuned, what would make you more appealing? I mean, that's, that's, this is really where we're going with this. This isn't, we're just going to throw around ideas and you go home and be the same old person. I mean, that's not what we're trying to do here. If you really want to know what's going to make you more appealing, get with somebody that really knows you. Ask them this a question. What would make me a more appealing, winsome captivating that people will be captivated by Jesus when they see me. I mean, I would challenge you. Talk with someone that knows you and then humble yourself and come underneath that and listen. And if it really shocks you, then go to somebody else that knows you <laughs> and compare notes and eventually you're going to draw you're going to draw you know what is it how do you how do you know what a straight line is there's three dots you'll connect the dots and say huh maybe i need to work on this this is getting in the way it may be useful for you you may think it's useful for you, but it is not useful for the kingdom. Yeah. It, needs to be put, it needs to be put aside. But that is the kind of real work that we need to do if we plan to move forward. Right? Amen. It's this, and this is all of us, you know? I, I, I would ask you to do that. You know, pray about it. I mean, if you're confused, I don't know. You know, I think I'm already at the top of my game. Yeah, I think I'm already this winsome. <laughs> I'm like that little girl right back here. I'm just like that, man. Everybody sees me just like that. I'm captivated. <laughs> and that's why I chose that picture. I thought, wow, that, that's, that was the picture for me. That was, I mean, I, she won me over. She didn't have to do nothing. You know, I, I'm attracted to her. I want to I be around that life. She's got life that's effervescent and flowing out. Those of you around children, some of you think, oh man, they got too much life. <laughs> they need to tone it down. <laughs> okay, next question. What is the greatest threat to the church of Jesus Christ? Christians are the greatest threat to Jesus Christ, to the church of Jesus Christ. And Christians are the greatest asset. That's right, are the greatest asset. As one person said, we are only one generation from a godless society. And on the flip side, we're only one generation from absolute revival. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to us. Right? Yes. How many of you have ever had a hangnail? Ever have a hangnail? What do you do? You just, just let it let it go? Let it get let it get in there a little deeper? You gotta get in there. Or have someone get in there. Right? What's interesting is that the toe can't help itself. It needs other parts of the body to go in there and cut. Isn't that right? And so it is with us sometimes. And I'm giving us permission to be able to speak to one another. Speak. Submit. In absolute love Amen. with one another. Mm -hmm. I mean, when your toe is hurting, 
All you, you don't have to do much. If it's your big toe and it's got a big old hang down, you just bump it a little bit. And so, you know, when people, when people are, you know, when people are hurting within the church and without the church, we need to gently restore the toe and come alongside each other. Okay, what is the greatest threat? And this is what, okay, yeah, this is what I, letting something other than Jesus occupy the throne of his church, of the hearts of his people. Anything else that occupies the throne. And what can I, what, what are the things that occupy the throne of our hearts if it's not Jesus? And what it, relationships, addiction. But how does relationships got up? How do relationships get in there? How do relationships get on the throne? It's all about me because I put them there. I put other things there. It's either it, either if it's not Christ on the throne, we're on the throne. Isn't that right? It's about me and what I want. And everybody that has come to Jesus it has nothing to do that we're perfect at all. Amen? Everybody that has come to Jesus knows that with me on the throne, life stinks. The problem is, is that we slip back up on there. I don't know how we do that. We go to bed at night with Jesus on the throne and wake up in the morning and all of a sudden we're on the throne. Yeah. How does that happen? Out of bed. What, what did you say? Out of bed. <laughs> how did that happen? You know, or all of a sudden you're here you are at church and you've been real nice and everything and all of a sudden this jerk cuts you off on the highway and all of a sudden Jesus ain't the throne no more. <laughs> I mean, Just trying to get out of the parking lot. <laughs> you heathen! What's wrong with you? You need to go to church now! <laughs> I mean, what, what do we do? You know, just, just, I, we mess up our <laughs> but, it, but, it's, it, but that's how subtle it is. It doesn't right. take much. You know, you're making something, you're, you're frying up eggs and something happens over your here and you come back and, you know, they're just crispy and hard and cruddy and all of a sudden our, this, this little egg thing can ruin our whole attitude. And maybe there's been a part of us on the throne all along. You know what I'm talking about? I do. I know what this is about. What are the false gods that occupy the, the hearts of God's people? What are the false gods that are up there? And, and the big one is ourself. How does anything get up on that throne? We put it there. Right? We have choice. All of us have choice. I submit that quarreling and division is one of the biggest enemies to the cause of Christ. Where does, it talks about it in James chapter 4. Where does quarreling and fighting, where does that come from? It, talks, it says it comes from our desires within. Because we don't get what we want. Because we don't get what we want. And when we don't get what we want, we get upset. Like I said, every church that I've ever been in, there's been quarreling, there's been fighting, there's been division. This isn't odd. This is not odd, friends. What would it look like if we were civil? I'm not saying we can't have discussions. 
but open discussions, honest discussions, submissive discussions, being able to deal with people where they are at, not pushing our own ideas. Isn't that right? Doesn't Jesus? Why would people be attracted to Jesus? It says that it says that sinners were attracted to Jesus. He was the friend of sinners, but Jesus never called a sinner a sinner. Look it up in the, in the New Testament. He never called anyone a sinner. He was attractive. Here it is. Philippians 2, do everything. Say everything. everything. What does everything mean? Everything. everything. I think in the Greek. <laughs> just, think, just think about this. What shift would have to happen in our hearts, in our heads, if we would do everything without grumbling or arguing? Get off the throne. Everything. Why? So that you will become blameless and pure. That, it sounds like grumbling and arguing are a big deal. Children of God without fault and a warped and a crooked generation, then you will shine among them. You will shine like stars in the sky as you hold the word of life as you go out. So we're shining people, not whining people. Right? We're shining! Not whining, complaining, grumbling, or arguing, or quarrelsome. It's a big deal, friends. How many like to be around people that are arguing, quarreling, and have anger? That's an atmosphere I don't want. Isn't that right? Oh, my. Let's keep going. This is Philippians. Oh, here's it. I, here's it. This is an interesting, before you get into the clip, this clip, all the people that are in this clip said they are a Christian. Believe they are a Christian. Absolutely a Christian. And then they line up these, they have this lineup of, they give them a question, and then they have to stand on the line where they are at. They agree with it, absolutely, or pretty much, or don't agree, or they're in the middle, or don't, you know, they're, and, they, and Christians have all sorts of different views. Let's look at this. Do all Christians think the same? Suggested by Wig Connick. Probably not, but let's find out. Stick around till the end. Enjoy the episode. You're like, well, I want to love who I want to love. There's that attraction. It's like, where do you draw the line? I'm a grown man. I like little boys. That is if we not go the by same. How we, you know that's not the same. I know you don't agree with that, and I know that it is the same. Christian music is good and some of it is lame, but that's the same <laughs> with like any kind yeah, of music. Yeah, any genre of music is so. the same way. I have to be like in a certain setting or a certain mind state to listen to it. I kind of agree that some is good and some is bad, but I kind of feel like 60 to 70 percent of it is not good <laughs> or like exciting, but maybe I'm kind of traumatized because I could only listen to Christian music when I was a kid, yeah, so I'm now I'm like... <laughs> yeah. That's relatable. Yeah, that might be part of it. Okay, <laughs> we're getting into it. There's a couple more clips. This is a, the, I, I'm kind of getting into oh, it softly. Oh, we just go ahead and second them? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no. Next, next slide. Okay, we need to get out of that mess. 
this aspect of arguing. So how do we talk about within the church and outside of the church when we don't see eye to eye? This is huge. It is. Yeah. This is going to make us attractive or it's going, to com it's going to repel people. It will make you attractive or people won't want to be around you. You understand what I'm talking about? And here, this is Paul t talking to Timothy. Timothy was a mentor of him. And he says to Timothy, keep reminding people of these things. What? Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Now, What's a foolish... What's that? Well, what I'm talking about is not foolish and stupid, so it's okay to argue about it? Wait a minute. But the, the, what it said before is that you're not supposed to argue about anything. Any argument is foolish and stupid. If you put scriptures together, isn't that right? Come on, let's talk about it. Yes. Any argument is foolish and stupid. Let, let, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to that passage. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Everything, right? Everything. So every argument, if you're going to argue, it's foolish and stupid. That's right. Okay, let's, let's keep going on this other. Because you know, what does arguments do? They produce quarrels. That's what it does. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. A Christian, a Christ follower, it's the same thing, right? Yes. It's a good idea if you don't quarrel. No. no. Must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone but certain people in their house. <laughs> to, to most folk, right? Is What does it say? But must be kind to everyone, able to teach, because if you're in a quarrelsome manner, if you've got a quarrelsome spirit about you, you can't be taught. How many ever try to talk to somebody that's in a quarrelsome, argumentative? They, they, they don't listen. Able to teach and not resentful. How many know that resentful and quarrelsome and anger, they're all intermixed? Amen? Okay. Brothers and sisters. Who's he talking to? This is to the Corinth, the church at Corinth. Brothers and sisters. He's talking to Christians, right? Yes. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Why? Mere infants in Christ, I, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You're still worldly. How does he know this? For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? This is the tipping point that if you know somebody is worldly, that really hasn't been converted in a deep place, hasn't found Jesus in a deep place. They are mere infant. It doesn't say they're not a Christian. They are not in the faith deeply. They act like the world because that's what the world acts like. All you got to do is turn on the news. People are fighting. Isn't that right? That's not how we operate. We don't use the weapons of the world. We use weapons of righteousness. As Werner Eller says, we use reverse fighting. We use weapons of love. We use weapons of grace. We use weapons of peace. We use weapons of truth. We use weapons of humility. Oh, my goodness. And then he says, are you not acting like mere humans? You're just like the world. This, the church looking like the world has been around for all the way from the beginning. <laughs> this is not some new revelation. Okay. 
next. I think you're, yeah, there's another, uh, here's another little uh, clip. Oh my goodness. Here's, now we're getting into it. This, this one will be. Yeah, I'm not saying that I'm a good person, but I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ who forgives me of my sin. I know where I place my faith, and that's why I know where I'm going to go. I don't know. It's hard to know exactly what specifically is considered the biggest sins that will keep someone from going to heaven, especially for me when I haven't put as much thought into it as I should. Christianity is not about just making sure you're checking off all the boxes to go to heaven. I feel like that robs us of the heaven that's present here on earth. All I'm responsible for is doing my best every day, and I pray that I do that every day, and I think that's true for everybody. Everybody is just responsible for their best. High five! <laughs> Christian high fives all around. Boom. 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 This is the whitest thing I've ever done. <laughs> okay, and then, and then at the very end of this clip, at the very end of all the clips, one of the guys says, where all these people were, there's at a, there was a point in my life where I could be where everybody was. Sure. Isn't that true? Mm-hmm. That we could be at all these different spots at one point. At, at a different place in our life. And if someone would have condemned us at any of those spots, what would, where would we be? The same grace that's been given to us, we need to extend to others. Okay, let's, let's keep going. I like what uh, Tim has to say, the only more difficult the only thing more difficult than discussing Christian convictions to the public square of the non-Christians is discussing them with fellow believers in the church. We, have, we may have more disagreements with non-believers, but our disagreements with fellow believers are more problematic and more emotionally charged. Isn't that true? Yeah. That's where the problem comes. Jesus says to his group of disciples, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, not the outsiders. By this, if you have love for one another. Why is it so hard to love the people that we're closest to? Why is it? Why are those the people that we have the most difficult time with? I think that's where it's easy for us to get me back on the throne. (coughs) Because we think we know them. And we form, we can form judgments we form relationships with them that are outside Jesus. We don't look at them through Jesus' eyes. Why is that? So if we're going to be winsome, we have to have different eyes. If we're going to win people and love people and be Jesus, but I thought, when I got, I, I'm, I'm reading this book, and that was in the book, and I said, wow, that's a keeper of a, of a quote. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Here it is in Romans 14. Let's read this one together. Romans 14. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Why do I say this? Let's look at this again. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. 
Let's keep going. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions, but weak in the faith department. Oh, come on. Are we into this today? <laughs> Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Why, did they, why are they like that? Why are any of us the way we are? Because we've gone through a lot of different experiences, a lot of different relationships, a lot of different this, a lot of different that. Treat them gently. We need to treat everybody gently. But this is fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Now, if you go into the NIV, this was the message. The NIV says, don't argue over disputable matters. It's, it's kind of an oxymoron. It's kind of weird. Wait a minute. If it's a disputable matter, shouldn't you dispute it? No. Don't argue over what's disputable. Isn't that interesting? God has not called us to argue someone into a certain faith or belief. You win them through the Jesus in you. St. Francis of Assisi says, preach the gospel wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. I always thought, wow, because our life speaks. Yes, we should talk about Jesus. The other week, uh, Sam said that he was over at Ralph's house. And Ralph was cooking. Ribs. <laughs> All off the he was cooking ribs. And, and he, you were really talking about those ribs, you know. You, <laughs> We talk about things we love. If we love Jesus, it will come out. You don't shove that down anybody's throat. He didn't shove the ribs down to anybody. I just want to go over to Ralph's and have some ribs down. <laughs> it wasn't like, Ron, you need to have them ribs. What's wrong with you? You don't know how to cook ribs. You know, you, you stink at cooking right No, he didn't get down on me. He didn't say anything about negative about me. He was attractive, and the ribs were attractive, and I wanted the ribs. That's the way. I mean, that's, isn't that our encounter with Jesus? That's the way that we just want to share it. We haven't shared it, but you got to have these ribs. He was like, I'm a vegetarian. Yeah, but that would eat, Ralph's ribs would even convert you. <laughs> you say, no way, no way. <laughs> but you see, you know, that was Sam's opinion. And we need to share it openly with love and go on. But every time I see Sam, he's talking about ribs. <laughs> every t and you know, and he has that grin on his face that I want to smack him. Because <laughs> I'm, it's like I'm missing out and I just want that. And that, you know, this relationship and talking about Jesus is that's what it needs to be like. Isn't it? That we're just so enthralled with him that we just want to share. That's winsome. I got another clap here. What now? You got another clap. Oh, another and who? Okay, there. Here's this is this is the one. This will make you squirm, maybe this one. I support the LGBT community. Three, two, one, go. About to 
make some enemies. <laughs> When we mention support, it means to accept. And I don't accept the lifestyles within the community, but do I love them? Do I want the best for them? I absolutely do. Do I think that we should be mean to them in church? Do I think that we should shun them from church? No, and I'm sorry that you guys had that experience because that is awful, that is horrible. No one should go to a church and feel like you need to run away from it. It's interesting though because the thing that has hurt me the most is actually the language with which you're speaking, which is m more confusing, I think. No one actually shunned me. It was more like this, more like, I love you, but like God kind of wants to like send you to hell. I do have Christian friends who are queer or gay, and they're struggling, they're abstaining from the lifestyle, but the LGBTQ community says there's nothing wrong with that lifestyle. They're proud of that status, not remorseful, or trying to be aligned with what the Bible says about it. You are literally picking one part of the Bible that you believe and throwing away everything else. There's like certain materials that we're not supposed to wear. There's certain foods that we're not supposed to eat, but we don't discriminate against people who do that. But we do discriminate against people who literally just love someone different. If you're gonna disagree with it, you also have to understand like the weight of what you are asking a queer person to do. When you look at someone and you feel like they're attractive and you have to disagree with that part of yourself every second of the day, you have to tell yourself, that's freaking wrong, that's freaking wrong. And at like every second, like you don't think that I should, I should not marry a woman that I love? I'm not saying you should be alone. I'm saying at the basis of anything, I want you to be who God created you to be. And I know that for you, you're believing that I was created this way to love this way, but I would actually wonder because you're like, well, I wanna love who I wanna love, there's that attraction. But when I, it's like, where do you draw the line when there's, I'm attract, I'm a grown man, I like little boys. I am a person, oh, I like, and I know girl. that you don't agree with that, no. but there are lines because that if we go by how we, you know that's not the I same know you don't agree with that, and I know that it is the same. I think the LGBT is like a huge topic within the Christian community but it doesn't make it any worse than like I drink and stuff and sometimes I drink in excess which is a sin um but it just doesn't get that's normalized you know what I mean like that doesn't get attacked as frequently as like a LGBT would like community would you know what I mean I just define support differently um I think you can completely support somebody's right to love and feel love without supporting homosexual activity homosexual activity is sinful raping a child is sinful. We can argue about what's worse or what's more acceptable or what our society has normalized, but at the end of the day, we all sin, we all sin in different ways, and none of those sins should be celebrated, none of those sins should be condoned, and all of us should be working not to change who we are, but to become more like Christ. Bingo. Yeah. Well said. So there are people all over the place and guess what? There may be a number of people that think all sorts of different things right in this room. Mm -hmm. And as we gather more people and more people come in, there's going to be people that have all sorts of thoughts, all sorts of beliefs. So how are we going to handle this? That's a big one. Yeah. How are we going to handle this? How are we going to talk? How are we going to shine in such a way that people will be attracted to Jesus? It's not, up for, it's not up to you and I to change people. It's up to you and I to shine the light. As if any of us here has the corner on truth or have arrived. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. There's going to be people that are Republicans that come into here. There are going to be people that are Democrats that come into here. There are going to be people that are independents that come into here. And there are going to be people that hate politics in general. That will be the majority. And so what, what are we going to, are we going to push 
a political bent on people. What would Jesus be? A Democrat or a Republican? Or an Independent? What would Jesus be? And this is huge stuff, I think. How we talk is huge. Everybody had a voice there. Everybody listened. But they didn't come to the same congregation. They went their separate ways. How are we going to do this? How are you going to do this? Make Jesus, make Jesus attractive. Remember where you've come from. Remember how Jesus talked to you when you were in the gutter, or wherever you are. <laughs> Along the way, none of us have arrived. So what does the Lord require of you? This is from Micah 6.8. This is what I believe where we, I'm just going to go through this passage and then we'll pray. He has told you, O oh man, humanity, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? This is what the Lord requires of you. Except to be just and to love and to diligently practice kindness and compassion and to walk humbly with your God, setting aside any overblown sense of importance or self-righteousness. This is what God is wanting us. This is what God is expecting of us. Okay, so the first one is, is to do justly. Next. Simply put, do what's right. Focus your actions on pleasing the Lord. Is what I'm about to say pleasing to the Lord? Is it pleasing God? What, what, what I'm about to do I plan to do blank because I know it pleases the Lord. Clean living before God and justice with our neighbors means far more to God than religious performance. Or it talks about any more than sacrifices. We could be religious on the outside and do all sorts of outside sacrifices. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Jesus never condemned anybody. He did not come into this world to condemn. Don't put people down, right? That's not the right thing. Criticizing is not the right thing. Quarreling and arguing is not the right thing. Never. Sharing love. Sharing Jesus. Helping out. Coming alongside. Paul says, to the weak I become weak in order to win the weak. I become a servant to all men in order that I could win some. Okay. Love mercy. Do I love being kind to others? Family, friends, etc. Do I love mercy? Do I want others to act toward me like I act toward them? That would be merciful, I would hope. Do I believe others should get what they deserve or do I desire to extend mercy? Do I love mercy? We do justice. We love mercy. If you want to find out who somebody really is, find out what they love. Isn't that right? That's true. Is love the motivation why I talk with, engage, and connect with others? That needs to be at the heart of who we are. We love mercy. We do justly. Do what's right. You love mercy. And if mercy comes over this justice, it's a beautiful thing. When God talks to me and points something out in my life, his arms are around me, hugging me at the same time. Amen. I can take it then because he's for me. And I know he's for me. And he loves me so much that he tells me the truth. But, but I, he can't tell me the truth unless I have his, his arms are around me. Love mercy. And the, and the final one is walk humbly. Is humility an essential character quality 
of my personality? This is a good question to ask yourself. Is humility. What does somebody that's humble look like? Yeah, well, you know, it's the opposite of proud. <coughs> humble. When you humble, you listen a lot. When you humble, you weigh your words. When you humble, you do your best to try to find common ground. Isn't that right? Is serving others the passion of my heart? It's a good question to ask. When engaging with and directing others, is submitting, should be a T there, is listening my normal practice? Is listening my normal practice? I get nervous when I hear conversations and one person is dominating the conversation. That means they're not listening. I want us to be listeners. Do I lead out of a submissive heart toward God? Is that what, how I lead? I'm following God. I'm submitting. I'm submitted to God. That's why I'm going the direction I am. I've already submitted it to Him. And that's why I'm doing and saying what I'm saying. Well, these are, that, if that doesn't describe Jesus, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. That's our Jesus. That's attractive, isn't it? And Jesus looks good on each of you. I always like those first disciples. Those first early disciples were not Christians. Because there were no Christians until Jesus came on the earth. He called people just like you and I. Going the wrong way or another way in life. And God has a plan for everyone. These kinds of statements are hurtful. This... These were all given in Christian meetings. This particular one was the headlining story in Christianity Today. Trump should be removed from office. It was done by the senior chief editor of Christianity Today and wrote a huge article on it after what happened in January a year ago. Guess what happened the next month? Subscriptions went up. But you know what else happened? There were 200 evangelical leaders that sent a scathing letter to Christianity Today. We Christians don't know how to talk. I won't feed into this mass hysteria nor scare my children by wearing a mask. This was said in a huge meeting of all sorts of Christians. Okay, if you, re if you really want to get an understanding of what I'm talking about, read Romans 14, that whole chapter. If we want to love our neighbor... Is it better to wear a mask? Because then, if I love my neighbor, then I'm being helpful to them because whatever I have won't come to them. <coughs> or is it more love for my neighbor if I don't wear a mask? Because if I wear a mask, I'm promoting fear. <laughs> Do you see how both could be right for both people? It's not one or the other. Isn't that correct? Because it talks about in 1 Corinthians, keep your opinion to yourself. That's one of the passages in there. Read that. I mean, that first Corinthians, Romans 14. It's in Romans 14. Sure, racism exists, but the idea of a systemic racism is fake news. We're going to talk about systemic racism 
Is there st systemic sin? Yes. Is racism a sin? <laughs> Let's think about it. This is this is a new news. Every every sin is systemic. But it doesn't mean it's bigger than Jesus. But you know, but and this, and this one, all lives matter, not just black lives. You tell that to a black person. What are they going to hear? I don't matter. I don't matter. That's what they'll hear. These kinds, all these kinds of things. They, this is out in the news. That stuff's in the news, and it has come into the church. And it's divided the church. And I hate it. We need to be kingdom people rallying around our God. Now that's attractive. That's what I want. I think I have one last, one last quote. It's an African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Amen. Amen. Okay, you know my mind works in strange ways. So this little ditty was coming to my head. What's ribs got to do, got to do with it? What's ribs but the second man's devotion? So here it is. Eve was created from the first Adam's rib. The church was created from Jesus, riven side. We're ribs. We need to be attractive. So seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And I love the stuff at the beginning. He said he was going to share four, but he shared five. So we just need to take the opposites. Be positive. Enthusiasm. Be for more things than you're against. Live differently, but be non-judgmental. Be friendly, smile, reach out. Seek first to understand, not to be understood. Be real, take off the mask, be invitational. It was great stuff. Um, are we here for sale? Yes, we're here for sale. On Tuesday at six o'clock, please join us. Any other announcements? Okay, let's worship with our tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings acknowledge your ownership and blessing. This week, May your blessing be upon us and our connection to you be evident to all. We ask that your gentleness, grace, and glory would make us winsome. Amen. We'll close with a scripture prayer from Psalm 90, verse 17. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Go in peace.